Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for what I hope is going to be an exciting panel and continuation from uh, yesterday's uh, uh, events. Uh, my name is Dominic Thomas. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm a professor at UCLA, uh, where Jacob's uh, been teaching in the Department of Germanic Languages for the last uh, year or so. That's how I got to, uh, to meet him. And uh, I work and write about questions related to uh, immigration, colonialism, uh, race in Europe, and so on. And I also work for CNN uh, and cover European politics uh, for them. I'm going to introduce the panelists in a moment uh, as I go through uh, the introduction to just sort of outline uh, the ways in which we are going to try and tackle um, the question uh, of identity through their uh, work, writings, uh, and research. As was quite obvious as the day went on yesterday, um, the question of identity, of course, is uh, riddled with all sorts of ambiguities, um, fractures, complexities, and actually quite different um, perspectives uh, on what is arguably um, the issue uh, of this early part um, of the 21st century. What we're interested in looking at today um, is perhaps another perspective on this through the idea or the prism or the lens um, of the post-colonial. Uh, if indeed, for let's say the most part of the 19th century and the early 20th century, the West constructed its relationship as a kind of white man's burden that had to travel and explore and conquer and civilize, uh, the burden of the post-colonial uh, era lies on those uh, post-colonial subjects who have been given or invested with the responsibility, um, one could argue the burden even, of having to reckon with that colonial um, or imperial legacy. Uh, for writers, uh, for those who occupy that very privileged space um, of literacy, um, the pen, uh, or one might say the camera, um, is also a, a weapon. And it's incredibly interesting to look at the, at the, at the range of post-colonial writers that have been reshaping the landscapes of Italian writing, British writing, uh, French writing. I think of writers like Shoyinka and Carol Phillips and Alain Mabancou, uh, Zadie Smith, Adichie, uh, and so on. And so on the panel today, we have to my left here, Christina uh, Alifara, uh, who's a novelist who's an Afro-Italian novelist, and we can talk and think a little bit more about what that means, born and raised in Somalia, uh, moved to Italy, um, grew up speaking um, uh, Engl uh, Italian uh, uh, with, her, uh, with her mother, and is going to read a little bit today um, from one of her works, and talk a little bit as well later uh, about the implications uh, of uh, the discourse of someone like Salvini, uh, whose rhetoric uh, has very specific impacts uh, on, on populations living in Italy um, who are marked as not being uh, uh, Italian. To the left, um, Trushkev Sandu, who's a professor uh, at uh, NYU, um, who works and writes about a whole range of, of things. Some of his works have focused on the city of London, and I think that's also interesting for us to think about notions of identity that are localized or restricted uh, to a particular urban space. We think of the way Paris works in that. Uh, in that regard, and certainly um, a city uh, like London. Uh, he writes and works uh, around a whole range of issues, ranging from the environment uh, to works about black and Asian writers and how they've dealt with, um, with cities, and specifically also uh, with the question um, of migration. I think what's important, too, in thinking about and looking at these voices are not so much the notion that they give voice to those that have no voice, because that's obviously problematic. Everybody has a voice but the particular way in which their works articulate a narrative that is often lost in the broader national narrative. And you can look at a theoretical work by Paul Gilroy, for example, who many decades ago now wrote There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, uh, an important work about race and belonging um, in Great Britain. And so these narratives, particularly in the case of, of Christina, point to an interesting aspect of Italian history and identity that tends to be forgotten in the national narrative, especially in the narrative as it is mythified, mythologized by um, political figures like uh, Matteo Salvini, the current minister uh, of, the, uh, of the interior. And I think one of the things that's important both in that writing and in some of the discussions that have taken place over the last day or so um, is the importance of, I think, of, of, of listening to different people's perspectives and simply listening, not um, countering them, not always um, rethinking or challenging them, but just uh, trying to understand 
uh, and imagine, which is what these creative writers are able to do, um, how different um, lives and experiences have been mapped out. When you look at the work of policymakers, um, the anonymity, for example, of those that die on Mediterranean crossings or the anonymity of deportation statistics, uh, the demeaning nature um, of the discourse of the state, um, bolstered as it is by far-right ideologues. Um, in France, their names are Zemmour and Finkelkraut. In Germany, Tilo Saracen, uh, Renaud Camus in France has spoken of de-civilization um, and of the collapse of the West that he attributes to migration um, in a context in which then poor working class communities are instrumentalized as the victims of globalization for whom the greatest fear is that they will then end up being even lower than those newly um, uh, arrived uh, migrants, a far-right ideology and far-right demagogues who bemoaned a blessed past, a blessed past when the other knew their place. And so the question really for us to look at are the ways in which some of these writers have talked about uh, protagonists um, and dealt with the question of who are these people um, where do they come from uh, and what is it that they actually um, want and how can you go about through these works humanizing um, these particular narratives uh, in a week or so the g7 will gather will gather in biarritz in france um, the optics of that when it comes to thinking about the question of identity where you will have Trump and Boris Johnson and Conte as the representative of the Salvini government essentially and Putin yeah. alongside Shinzo Abe and Macron and, and Merkel is itself quite disturbing. And every single European election for at least the last decade or so has focused on this famous, these three eyes, um, immigration, um, identity uh, and Islam. Um, some, in the introduction the other day, spoke um, of vitriol um, coming from um, uh, both sides. But when one thinks of the discourse of Trump talking about um, bad hombres and people coming from shithole countries and so on and so forth, we also have to think more carefully about what it does mean to be on the side of the other in the face of this um, particular discourse. A couple of other things. But I think are uh, interesting for us to think about these works is the way in which they deal with the question of belonging. So we heard a lot yesterday about different like micro identities in Great Britain that is obviously very different from the French context, let's say, where in England one can be Scottish, English, Welsh, Northern Irish, and Muslim, but also belong to that category that is Britishness. That's not available in France, where the colorblind republic, where a constitution just in the last months removed the word race from the French constitution, you're either French or you're not. And many have argued that the indifference to race in the constitution is also therefore an indifference to the question of racism. 50, 60 years ago, the Martinican poet Aimé Césaire talked about what it meant to be a part of France rather than feeling apart from France. And the French word appartenance means belonging. And so the question of being an insider and, and an outsider, um, of living like Christina on a hyphen, somewhere between the Afro uh, and the Italian, um, when one part of that hyphen is always subjected to race to what, uh, and suspicion to what Salman Rushdie had called double unbelonging. Um, so as we um, uh, develop uh, this discussion, um, each um, participant will speak for five, uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit of a, a conversation. And our hope is to open up, and the desire of the panelists is to open it up to you um, as soon as possible um, to take your questions and to have them shape the, uh, the way in which our uh, discussion uh, is going to go. So Christina um, is going to start. Uh, you will explain what you're doing, and you will also be reading, which is important, in yeah. Italian. Yeah. Uh, and we will have up on the screen uh, an English translation of, of some of the text. Christina could, of course, have read it in English, but I think you'll also talk about why it's important to read it in, in the language in which you wrote it. Okay. So thank you to you, thank Mr. You. Chef, for being on this panel. Thank you, Dominique, for this beautiful introduction. Uh, yeah, um, I wanted to yeah to tell a little bit how I started um, writing, and um, so I, I grew up in Somalia, as Dominique was saying. And um, my mother is Italian, and um, uh, people often asked me when when I moved to Italy, why you speak Italian so well? Uh, how did you learn the language? And uh, I would say, oh, this is my mother tongue. Is I, I, I have never learned the language because I was born uh, speaking Italian. And uh, this, I mean, this um, 
uh, people in Italy don't know that it is this legacy. It's not a coincidence that I speak Italian because my father went to Italy as a student, as, uh, um, as many, I mean, um, people coming from African countries were going to, uh, for example, f to UK or France. Uh, he went to Italy, but uh, the history of colonization was, is completely, was completely erased from the Italian history. And I think that uh, this is also why Italy is not, um, is not uh, it has never been ready to understand what migration is because uh, when I went to Italy, it was 1991, and uh, in, in that year, it was uh, suddenly Italians realized that it started to be a country of immigration instead of a country of emigration. So, um, and they were not prepared to it. And this is the year when uh, Umberto Bossi, what, with the Lega Nord, um, have uh, 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 had a, a lot of. of of consents from the population. And um, before there was this kind of division between the, the south, the, the southern Italy, Italy that was poorer and the north, and suddenly the enemy became the, the migrant, the, um, the black one who was coming, who was coming from abroad. Um, so um, I, I felt like um, it was like uh, language has always been my weapon. Even when I was talking to people, uh, I was trying hard to speak as as better as I could because it was my my, my protection my own way of uh, uh, of protecting my identity and to impose my uh, presence my uh, how can I say um, in, in in the world in, in the Italian I mean population among Italians and um, and I always tell this story I wasn't able to find the language to write for many years because uh, how could I, um, I share a story that people were not prepared to receive? And um, I always use this metaphor because uh, Somali, after 1991, a lot, um, um, a huge number of Somalis arrived to Italy in Rome and the Italians didn't recognize this presence. So they were forced to go away. Many of them went to London, went to, uh, went to, uh, to Canada. And so you have these small communities, also Somali speaking Italian, which, which is very interesting because, I mean, Italy would have been the natural place they, uh, they were expecting to go after the civil war. And Italians were not recognizing them. And uh, um, so um, I went to visit some of my family members and um, I, I, I left very early in the morning. And um, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't use uh, uh, glasses at the time. I mean, I, I'm short sighted and uh, I, I wanted to put my lent, lenses on, my contact lenses on, and um, I dropped one of the lenses and I couldn't find it. And I was hurried and so, what I did was I, I just left with uh, one lens on, on one side, and who is who is short sighted knows that um, you feel as if um, uh, uh, I mean you, you your, your gaze somehow you can see uh, the other people, but you feel as if you are also protected by this veil uh, of seeing and not seeing is something that um, so I arrived in the diaspora with this double perception very neat on one hand and uh, and uh, and <laughs> and very confused on the other and uh, I think I use this as a metaphor also of identity and I, I found this very beautiful quotation from um, 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 an, um, a, a French philosopher whose name is uh, um, Helen Siskus, and uh, she says, uh, not to see is the fact penury thirst, but not to see oneself seen is virginity, strength, independence. Not seeing, she could not see herself seen. That's what had given her her blind woman lightness, the great liberty of self-effacement. Never had be, uh, she be thrown into the war of faces. She lived in the above without image, images, where big indistinct clouds roll. And so, um, um, so this is uh, uh, somehow um, my, 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 my relationship also with the Italian world at the very beginning, this kind of distance and, uh, and proximity at the same time. And um, in the first book, what, what, what I tried to do was, um, for me, um, th there were three characters and uh, um, how you define yourself, how you put root against when you have lost all your, your points of references. Um, and the, the characters of my novel 
look for the answer through relationships. So they, they tell their story to somebody uh, which is uh, outside his own world and inside at the same time. Some, somebody is outside and somebody is inside. So um, I think that it, identity is always different. Uh, re it, uh, it's related to the person you are talking to. So I'm a different person if I talk to, to, to Dominic, for example, or uh, if I talk to somebody who has my experience or, or have a completely different experience. And, um, uh, but um, the, the piece that I wanted to share to you is, is, uh, uh, is from my last novel. Uh, uh, the title of uh, the novel is Il Comandante del Fiume, the commander of the river, and um, it is, I, I, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it's like a coming of age story of a, an 18 years boy who, um, who was raised in Rome, and um, it's something that, um, I mean, uh, there are a lot of people now that were born in Italy, they are black, but they are not recognized as, as Italians, and uh, in Italy there is also this kind of problem, because uh, citizenship is not, um, is not a, a right that is recognized uh, to people who are not who are born in Italy but have parents from different origins. So, um, and um, so um, this is that that this chapter in this chapter in particular in this chapter he meet a guy uh, a boy uh, who is older than him and um, his name is Liban and um, he doesn't speak Somali anymore and uh, his mother he is in Somalia but he cannot talk to her because he he, f he forgot the language and um, so he asks the protagonist, Yeber, um, to, to go and to, to call the mother with him together. And, but Yeber thinks that he doesn't remember the language and he, does, he doesn't want to translate for him. And uh, so they go uh, in this call center and he tries to speak to the mother of uh, his friend. So I'm going to read this in Italian. Yeah. Il call center era un negozietto angusto, con dentro tante cambine a vetri. C'erano scritte in varie lingue e oltre le pareti trasparenti si vedevano le persone parlare. Ognuno muoveva la bocca in modo diverso, ma non si sentivano le voci. Sembravano tanti pesci dentro un acquario. Appena entrati, il gestore, un uomo con la barba bianca, ci ha chiesto «Dove volete chiamare?» e noi gli abbiamo spiegato la situazione per farci dare un telefono doppio, dato che io e Liben dovevamo sia parlare che sentire. Dopo qualche minuto ci fa entrare in una cabina con due cornette, lo spazio è risicato e fa un caldo infernale. Siamo sudati, l'aria è bollente, il numero telefonico è infinito, il prefisso è infinito e il tempo che ci mettono a rispondere è infinito. Mi sembra di stare in una grotta umida e penso che anche il telefono dall'altra parte sia in un posto del genere. Una caverna bollente come la nostra, con dentro la madre di Liben, che aspetta da vent'anni. Il telefono squilla, attendo la voce e Liben mi fissa perché ha paura del mio silenzio. Mi dice coraggio e dall'altra parte sento Hello, Yahweh, pronto, chi è? Parlano in somolo e io capisco tutto, ma finora ho solo trasformato il somolo in italiano. Non so trasformare l'italiano in somolo io. Dall'altro capo del telefono dicono Hello e Liben mi ripete coraggio e io vedo le parole in fila dentro la testa, le vedo e le sento tutte, scalciano e prendono forma come noci. E io spingo con la fronte e con gli occhi per farle passare. Le parole sono dure, mi tagliano la testa, come quando fa caldo e bevi qualcosa di gelido. Sento una fitta tra gli occhi e riprendo fiato. Ma anche così il dolore non smette. Allora ricomincio a spingere con forza ed ecco che sento le parole venirmi alla gola e tocco la loro forma con la lingua. Spingo l'aria fuori e le parole fuoriescono intere dalla mia bocca. Vedo lì ben sorridermi e dire «Mamma, sono io!» Lo dice balbettando e io ripeto balbettando le sue stesse parole «Hoyo, wa aniga» e le parole «Mamma, sono» e «Io» sono uguali nella nuova lingua, forse solo un po' più secche. Lì ben è frenetico e vuole parlare di troppe cose, di quanto l'ha cercata, di quanto gli è mancata, di quanto l'ha pensata, ma riesce a dire solo parole semplici e la madre ripete le stesse cose e io sono la madre e il figlio allo stesso tempo. Siamo nella grotta e l'aria è bollente. Io e Liben siamo tutti sudati e teniamo ciascuno una cornetta legata a un filo. La voce della madre arriva a tutti e due e le nostre voci le arrivano insieme. Sento le parole tutte intere nella bocca. Era tanto tempo che non le sentivo e quelle parole sono le parole del figlio e sono anche le mie. Io e Liben diciamo insieme Hoyo, mamma e Waniga sono io. 
Thank you so much, um, Christina. We will come back to that, and I'm sure there'll be um, some questions. Um, so, Jeff yeah, Sandu, um, over to you. Yeah, um, the word catastrophism um, came up um, yesterday. It's a great word. <laughs> it's quite sort of libidinal. Everybody loves good catastrophe. But I guess um, one, of, one of the sort of things motivating um, some of my work, um, actually, I, I was really interested in sort of Caribbean and Asian writers who were interested in medieval poetry and were making connections such as people like Wilson Harris between the rainforests and the jungles in Guyana and a kind of a syllabic crunch and what they saw as a kind of both poet poetry and a kind of politics that they found in medieval poetry. Um, they, they felt that as well, the centuries in between was a, a kind of sort of false history. And I was, uh, and this somehow sort of spoke, spoke to me and, and I came across this quote from Richard Devizes. This is almost a thousand years ago, and he's talking about difficulty of recruiting um, for, um, for the Crusades. And it's a problem because apparently people don't fight like they used to. Um, and he says the problem is that, especially in the cities, um, you know, there's too many actors, there's too many effeminates, there's too many strolling players, there's too many girly men, and there's too many moors. Um, and uh, and, it, and it, again, it's, it's a very sort of anti, sort of, uh, or, or it's almost a kind of, sort of Saint Augustine approach to the city. The city is a place of mixture, of metissage, of mutability, of weirdos, of conviviality, of pleasure, of licentiousness, and that's sort of dangerous. And in the, and in the, in the midst of all this, there's all this, both the reality and the kind of, sort of specter of uh, of ethnicity. But already. You know, nearly a thousand years ago, nine hundred years ago, there's too there's too many there's too many wogs, um, and they're, they're they're not good for you know, the military mo morale. Uh, they're, they're insufficiently sort of patriotic enough, and you know, the more you look into it, there's always too many. Um, you know, whether it's in an Elizabeth, Elizabethan period, where it's in the 18th century, um, however many. There are, um, there are foreigners, outsiders, who, who, whatever constitutes the outsiders. Um, it's the kind of the sort of the gas that uh, that they uh, that, that is sort of released by your own imaginations, your own sort of perturbed um, sort of phobias um, of them. Um, in, a, in a lot of my writing, I, was just, I think I was just bored. Um, I was both bored and kind of lonely because I was I was I think I was bored by both the indifference to, sometimes hostility towards migrants, but also the celebration of them as new, as kind of infusion, uh, infusers of, kind of new vitality or new blood or new rhythms. Um, and I, I guess I've always been scared of the new myself. And uh, maybe I'm a very old soul. So I, I, I just, I, that didn't sort of resonate with me. And a lot of the most uh, kind of Resident experiences I had. I remember doing a sort of project with um, Zimbabwean refugees in um, in Glasgow, and there was a guy called Abel Miller, and he was talking incredibly sort of lyrically. And he said, "You know, I've got I've got nothing. My family, I don't know where they are anymore. I had to flee um, in the middle of the night, and here I'm not allowed to get a job. I can bar uh, barely eat. Um, I don't I bet I don't have a past. I don't seem to have much of a future. And all I have are ghosts." And I talk to ghosts in the daytime, and I talk to it in the nighttime, and sometimes it makes me cry, and sometimes ghosts give me sucker. They're the only kind of family that, uh, that I have. And I felt very comfortable um, in thinking about sort of migration and thinking about ghosts um, and trying to construct, um, uh, wanting to kind of construct a narrative about migration which sort of repudiated the kind of nowism um, of a, of a lot, lot of narratives, and I suppose I just did it via a kind of, sort of literary historiography going back sort of many, many hundreds of years. But always I found, in retrospect, being drawn towards kind of outlier writers, writers that even if they were being published notionally as representatives of a new migrant group or as community spokesmen, often were either declaring or showing in their writers that there barely was a community, um, that they did not feel themselves to be representatives of it, were writing in ways and creating noisescapes that seemed to be at odds and all kind of elbows from what they were meant to be writing about. 
Um, so whether you call them outlier writers, avant-garde writers, uh, race traitors, um, reactionaries in some ways, at the very moment that they're being published or, or being claimed or celebrated for giving you a microscope into a terrain, a social demographic sort of terrain, they were trying to wriggle out of that. And, and it reminded me of something, you know, that's sort of come up in a number of com conversations as well. I, I always feel very equivocal about the word kind of community, um, something that migrant groups, ethnic people are meant to have. Um, and, and oftentimes the word community is used in the absence of a community. Um, you know, it's almost a sort of tribute that you're paying to the, to, to the absence. And all these categories um, a lot, a lot of, um, seem to be very motile. I remember a lot of the writings that I was doing, I was drawn to often autobiographical, autobiographical accounts of almost pre-migration. Um, and this is common in pretty much every group, in every city, in every country, where people come often on their own and because they're, they're poor, they're trying to save money, and they end up you know, living on the same sort of bed or in the same space with people of different religions, of different, um, different backgrounds. They drink whiskey, just like we do. Um, they, um, oh God, it's, um, and um, they, they, they do haram things, forbidden things. Um, they go to strip clubs, um, they sing, they booze, they wench away, and then oftentimes they're, they're women. Um, join them, and then, uh, and then they have to erase those pasts. But I, I like, I'm drawn to that moment of the, the sort of a pre-community where as a new kind of identity is, is emerging. It's a, it's a kind of interim sort of time where people are going to places, hanging out in the British context with Irish people, with uh, people from Hungary, from the Ukraine. Uh, you know, in some of the words we use these days about you know, South Asian migration or Windrush migration, I, I don't really recognize a lot of it because having grown up in those areas, what I, I saw was a lot of admixture and kind of uh, mutual pollution, um, a lot of carousing. Um, on a Friday night when you get the, the pay slip, uh, the banter in a works bus, um, doing stuff which is about a kind of useful splintering of, uh, of selfhood. When I go back these days to my family's house, all of that stuff, it, it's, it's not even a memory anymore because capitalism, entrepreneurs, pump into the living room of, uh, of, of my parents, cable TV. And it just gives them a, a constant loop of stuff that is happening in the Punjab. They watch nothing else, they hear nothing else. Uh, uh, my sister's trying to get my father to use a phone, and he's basically on a WhatsApp group. And just, again, it's a Punjab, Punjab, Punjab. And it's as if decades never really sort of happened. And after all the life, all the creolization, all the noisecapes, all, all the interactions, sometimes hos um, hospitable, sometimes sort of less so. Actually, his sort of life is much more monocultural than it's sort of ever been. So I, I look back and I hanker for those periods in, in the British context, particularly in sort of 50s to the 1970s, where there was something a bit more vulgar, a bit awkward, a bit less documented in the literature, certainly not the kind of stuff that sociologists try to write about or that is you know, talked about by, by, spoke, uh, by spoke, spokespeople. But it's those sort of layers of conviviality, admixture, strange anecdotes, um, awkward adventures. And I think that's the process of, I don't know, developing new forms of identity. And of course, you know, all of these words seem to me really sort of fuzzy. Um, you know, we're all sort of awkward agglomerations, and in my case, of religion, of caste, of class, of small townishness, of nationhood, um, a nationhood which is always relational and contextual in relation to the Commonwealth or to the European Union or, or you know, the Atlantic or, where, or wherever. And every time any sort of label is given to you, it feels both like a maybe a homecoming or a sort of partial, partial shelter, but I squirm and I wriggle from them all. And those are the kind of the writers to whom I am drawn. And those just awkward buggers, male and female, are the ones that I want, especially in this period where 
migrant histories are being kind of sort of more and more narrated on screen and on, on writings, a, a usable past, a righteous past is being constructed. I, I kind of, I want a more vulgar, <coughs> dissensual migrant past still to be sort of there available. Mm -hmm. Well, I find, um, so I remember, you know, from school either in England or in France, it's like, you know, the time when you had like geography classes, they were always teaching you about where things were, and I thought that was really boring, you know, mm -hmm. where that, rather than asking, you know, why are they there? Mm -hmm. And in your work, and all your writing, all this language of um, terrain and, you know, boundaries and scapes are there, and you keep coming back to, you know, cityscapes, migrantscapes, mm -hmm. sexscapes, whatever they, they mm -hmm. happen to be. But for you, is that, are those ways of thinking about, like, is each scape an identity island? Is he, uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, um... I mean, one thing I'm really not interested in so much is sort of debates around kind of migration and identity, um, which, uh, which emphasise economics. I'm interested mostly in the imagination. And there comes a point in somebody's life, in the middle of the night, or cumulatively building up, where they say, enough, I can't be here anymore. Um, I don't want to be here. This, this thing which is built up over kind of geologies of, sort of a settlement, it's not, not enough. And it's not usually the poorest people who migrate. Um, they can be very poor, but it's usually the poorest people don't have access to, to those kind of levers. Um, so it is always a fantasy, a romance, um, a whisper of a new life, a new rhythm, a new, a new tactility that you're hungering for. Um, and there, there never was a home. I mean, my, you know, my parents, like many parents, have these fictions about where home uh, lay, uh, lays, where is the foundation of your being. Um, but in that village, there's so much beef, there's so much whiskey, there's so much fighting, there's so much uh, rollicking and adventuring, and, and we forget to ourselves that, you know, some of us went off to Mex uh, Mexico at the turn of, start of the 20th century. Some of us spent, in my own family's life, we, we went to Australia, they went to Hong Kong, they went to China. And we deny even those mobilities to ourselves in order to prop up a narrative of solidity that we then contrast apparently to the dangers and the awkwardnesses of, sort of being in Britain. But at both ends, we were always kind of unstable in a way that sort of, sort of worked. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we, we lie to ourselves. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'm just interested in bad migrants. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not virtuous ones, not one, yeah. ones that well, need cultural philanthropy, right. not ones that are can be utilised in order to, you know, rejuvenate whatever host mm. community yeah. that they go to. But for Christina, and it's interesting, especially with the Italian language, even if, let's say the French language, you know, there's just like, there's one word to talk about it all. It's immigration, immigration. It mm. means both the physical movement from A to B, and it's also the, the quote, the ethnic um, race relations realities. There's no separate term. And the Italian language really struggles with that. So not only do you struggle to find whether it's immigrato or what category is going to designate these particular people, but from, and it's, you know, time flies, but from 91 to today is almost 30 years. You have narratives, your work that's dealing with those that arrived, let's say, in the 90s and are dealing with a particular reality that have grown up in Italy born in Italy, have no other point of reference. Um, Somalia is ancient history, Ethiopia, Libya, etc. That colonial past is very much a past, and yet at the same time as they have come of age and become adults, um, Italy continues to um, be positioned on the front line of this real but also um, constructed uh, migrant crisis discourse, right, with Lampedusa being on the front lines of new arrivals that look like those that are there in the diasporic communities. And, and so how, are you, you know, how do you deal or, you know, or reconcile those like, transgenerational questions you know, in your work? And then also, I just want, I just, I'm obsessed with sort of talking about Salvini, is, is how, what is the impact of the, you know, of, the, of the Liga going sort of global Italy, you know, relinquishing the notion of the North and becoming this pan-Italian, structure to, to talk about the question of identity and migration uh, today and what is the the impact then on communities of, of this discourse yeah um, so um, I think um, um, I think that 
the, 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 the most dangerous thing is, is always like the language that Salvini uses and uh, and the, I mean the uh, the way he um, he, he doesn't um, I mean um, he tweets every time he he, he, he just he, he doesn't say nothing he lies and uh, but you don't have the time also the people just absorb what he, he says but then um, if you um, he, he talks about numbers of migrants that are arriving is not true and actually I think that uh, also Salvini was not the most dangerous one because before Salvini there was this uh, I mean um, um, Treaty with Libya that uh, was m uh, far more dangerous and and uh, um, for for migrants. That's what Salvini is doing. Salvini is very dangerous for his ret rhetorics and what he's inculcating into into the population. And um, I think that it's 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 the only thing that to react to this is just to find other point of um, references uh, in the imagination. I think that um, writing for me it was always important talking about these communities to uh, to use um, different I mean different point of uh, cultural point of references and mixing them with uh, with uh, the Italian culture and uh, to make them understandable and use also different metaphors and uh, for example uh, it was very interesting because when I, I used to live in Italy um, there was there is still a group of Somalis that lived uh, moved in, to, to Italy before the civil war uh, so and uh, many people were arriving in the, in the last years, in, in the 2000s. And so what was this relation, the relationship with the new arrivals and uh, the people who uh, were there uh, in Italy already? Um, and it was very interesting because they, 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 Somalis are very funny with words. And so the old Somalis, Somali, the previous community was called Vecchielire, like the, the old coins in, in Italy and the new ones, Titanic. And, uh, and <laughs> because of the, yeah. And, um, but, it, but in a way, um, I thought that if the Somali community or the, or the previous community would have been maybe bigger, um, uh, maybe, they, it will be um, also um, a sort of a bridge uh, that would um, somehow prepare um, the, 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 the cities and the country for this new 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 arrival. So, this this my my obsession is always uh, this connection with migration and colonization that was never linked somehow in Italy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered no. well. Thank yeah. you so much to both of you, and I'd love to open it up if we can have a microphone um, go around the room for as long as Alan will let us um, keep going here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, are we good for a few now? I thought it was really interesting the point that you made about bad <coughs> migrants or immigrants, um, because there's something definitely in that. I'm half Algerian and half English, and I was brought up to think that girls didn't have sex and they didn't, you know, go out with guys and that they didn't definitely didn't smoke, only prostitutes smoke. Um, and I remember going to Algeria as a teenager and going away from my parents and having other friends. And I went to a salon and obviously all the, sa the beauty salons are all hidden from the outside. And when you get inside, it's completely different. So you'd get the women arriving with the niqab and everything. They'd take it off and they'd be like, where's the Marlboro? And it'd be like Marlboro Reds, so like proper hard cigarettes. And I was like, oh my God, I thought it was just the prostitutes, but it's the niqabis as well. And you'd sit there and then you'd have these conversations in the salon with the girls, you know, getting all their treatments done and everything. And you'd realize what was really going on. And as, a, as an Algerian in the UK, I was so shocked. I was like, oh my God, you have sex. And you're like, you smoke and you do all of these things. And, and there was a weird split between being a minority in the UK where because you're a minority, your experience is limited to your family and therefore it can be controlled much more. And then you have a warped image of what your own culture is. And so you start to think that it is something limited to being behaving in a certain way. And so that was really interesting, that point that you made. But I, I would just add on the thing that I think that for my, for my dad, it became something that he would, didn't really think about having kids with a white woman and suddenly realized that we weren't going to be like him and that he was gonna lose his connection with us. And how could he possibly have his stamp on who we are? And it was enforcing kind of rules and a sense of like, this is how we speak, this is how we behave, and these are the expectations on you. And I think the hope was at the end that we wouldn't do what he did 
and kind of dilute the culture even more by marrying outside and he wanted us to end up finding somebody potentially who would you know help grow that community but I, yeah I just kind of wanted to develop on that thing why do you think that it is that you know even within the communities people kind of try and um, create that image of having like a, a very simplistic culture yeah I mean I, 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 I relate to feeling incredibly imprisoned as a kid and being incredibly fearful and being encouraged to be fearful of everything every anybody because they're, they're, everybody else is a thief you can't tell them anything but they're going to use that information against you or they'll steal from you or they'll break into your into your house your relatives there's always beef with relatives uh, it's, it's always sort of unclear so you can't really share anything well with with uh, with relatives yeah you, you live, I found myself just living constantly in a kind of sort of past of the icons and symbols and religiosity, being scared of touch. And I, I, when I, I, find, I find myself really sort of drawn when, when I'm doing sort of interviews or research to people talking about the first time they touched somebody else. And it works but sort of both ways. I mean, sometimes I was seeing a project actually with um, older sex workers and they would talk about white and, uh, and non-white men not necessarily wanting to have sex, and not actually necessarily want to talk, but just to be touched by, um, by, by, by somebody. But simultaneously, uh, simultaneously I, did, I was doing something in sort of fairly rural Scotland, and uh, from about 1920s, maybe to about sort of 1960s, it were you know, lot, lot, both sort of seasonal labour, um, onion johnnies, as they were known, with sort of strings of onions selling around. But you had lots of door-to-door -door salesmen, usually sort of South Asian, who would go around, and they didn't speak much English, and just say, silk, cotton panties and the people are spending time in nursing homes and many of the people in their 70s 80s and they were talking about what a kind of immensity of history lay in that encounter first of all you open your door often in a very rural um, community and it really is a big sort of cultural threshold it's like uh, it is like the limin the lim liminality it is its own and some of them shuddered and went back indoors many of them screamed some of them touched the person uh, the children oftentimes ran behind the, the, the salesman and tried to see if they had tails um, that they could pull because a dark person with sort of shiny white teeth could only be a sort of part animal. And, um, and then <laughs> so, uh, and at the same time, all these other stories came up and you know, there was quite a few sort of Asian medics in Scotland. And a lot of the medics were telling me about you know, the first time you, you, you know, the, the patient went in and they saw they had um, a non-white doctor. And to be both seen by a non-white doctor, but to be touched or to be naked in front of them or even partially undressed. Sometimes they, they just stormed out or they thought it was a, a front. Sometimes it was that, that moment of contact was a pathway to some sort of tentative new story. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot, there's a lot of... That's, that's, that's part of the control, isn't it, of all parents to create little micro-regimes of fear and anxiety which maybe work, may maybe fuck you up, maybe you run away from and you, yeah, and you resist. Um, and it was a very moralist, but you know, it, was, it was a very moralistic and sort of religious um, um, fear regime, in, in, at least in my experience. So other questions, and also Christina, and both of you, up to any question, if you both want to respond or say something, um, if okay. not, you say, if not. Yeah, happens. no, I just wanted to add some, something very shortly that, I think that, that that happens because often in uh, outside, uh, I mean, you 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 uh, mythologize your your culture. Many people mythologize. You essentialize your, the the culture, and uh, and whereas the culture is something that is not stable as identity. We, how can we talk about about about, about culture? So, um, yeah. So this is only. I think that it's very important. I think just following on from that and also picking up yesterday, I was really interested. I've got four children, so I'm always considering the next generation almost above our own. Um, and I, I was very interested with what Majit was saying yesterday about the riots in riots. I mean, the, 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 the protests in Birmingham outside the schools of the... You know, you've got a 52% of people, it's basically kill the gays, that's their, their, their motto. And these are children in, in, a, in a British school. So we're talking here about 
parents, but what do you think the role of the state is within these countries, whether it be Italy, France, England, wherever it is where we have, um, how can we best integrate those different cultures and help the children, actually, the next generation, to integrate better? And what do you think the role of the state is in that, in the sense, should we say, okay, we need to respect that religion and therefore this is what we should or shouldn't teach, or do we teach liberaliz liber 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 yeah, liberalism and, um, and, and, and be open-minded? Which way do you think the state should go on that? I would yes. like you, Christina. Oh. You think, I mean, yes. we've talked a lot, obviously. I mean, the, the, the problem is which state, right? I mean, if yeah. you look at the current, you know, Italian state, where Salvini strategically chose to be Minister of the Interior rather than take an, uh, you know, other political office within the, the cabinet, is he has very particular notions as to what direction um, integration is and, um, and what constitutes um, in that subtext um, it's very clear who's an Italian and who's not. And so um, assimilation and integration becomes this you know, hierarchical move towards some kind of conformity mm -hmm. that erases any kind of um, even possibility of a discussion around cultural particularity and so on. And we see that narrative very powerfully in, in Europe today, that to be, uh, to be a European um, is to be white, is to be Christian, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which has no correlation with the reality of the geopolitical space, nor with the recent experience of, um, uh, of many, uh, many communities. Um, certainly, um, Christina can speak um, about the, you know, the Italian context, but this has been uh, an age-old um, discussion uh, in the French context. I mean, the immigration question in France only really starts at 1970 when the borders close, and those some are in, some are not, some are in with papers, and some have no papers. And the whole of the subsequent legislation becomes around integration into a school system that is, in theory, um, secular, uh, with a total, except for a few private Catholic schools and other religious denominations, that you go to school, there is no um, religious interference and so on. Yet, when you get to December, uh, there are Christmas celebrations that take place within the, uh, the confines of the school. Um, you have seen in France from um, the late 80s a banning of uh, a headscarf, the veils, the burqa, and more recently attempts to prevent people from wearing burkinis. So there is a spe very specific process through which the state is trying to invisibilize through policies certain forms of cultural expression and so on. And you could argue that that has rekindled uh, uh, and, and forced people to kind of reaffirm certain forms of identity belonging. But I think that that question for the children that are not immigrants, and this is the problem too, particularly in a place like France, as they are talked about as being second generation, third generation, with different names being granted to them, the combination, I mean, I know the, the word burr, the mixture of Arab and the reversal of the letters, so you become a, a burr. You're somehow neither French nor Algerian, or are you both French and Algerian, right? Uh, and then their kids are called the rebu. You've taken the word and flipped that around, and it's a designation of an identity to try and categorize these young people. But, you know, young people that are born and raised in France, what I thought was so interesting is that in 2005, when Sarkozy took over the Minister of the Interior, uh, there were uh, the big riots triggered by these two young kids that jumped into the power station um, and were electrocuted. Uh, young people from French housing projects, predominantly ethnic minorities, took to the streets to actually do something very French, which was, ask, which was to ask for more integration, more assimilation, and more belonging to the French Republic. Ten years later, some of those young kids were strapping bombs to themselves. So integration failed, assimilation has failed, and I think that the responsibility is on the state, that what Sarkozy did was completely ineffective, but the socialist government of Hollande was equally ineffective in the ways in which they they've went about you know, presenting a kind of discourse of, of who's French and who's not, and, uh, uh, and so on. You know? just, to, just to push back slightly on that, in, so, so in Birmingham, using that specific example that we talked about yesterday, what do you think, w what does the panel think the answer is in, in there? You know, we have a situation where we have predominantly um, Muslim children within the school being taught that homosexual relationships are okay. Is, what, what do you think that, I mean, because that's just a very small example yeah, yeah. of a much, much, much bigger problem, but it's very specific. Yeah. 
what is the answer there? Because clearly we're not doing it right, right? We've established that. That's, we know right now and what's been happening over the last decades ha isn't working properly. How do we make sure that the, the next generation grow up feeling different and then the generation after that grow up feeling different? Do you want to tackle it or should that? I mean, up to you. So do, do, do you want to um, I, don't, I don't know that particular instance and I don't think whatever sort of solution temporary or, or permanent in that one is kind of what, what we're both talking about that and not um, and I think I mean I remember when I, I went to a Christian school that was barely a Christian school and I, I mouthed hymns and actually sang them quite heartily um, was, I was never chosen to be in a choir so maybe too heartily um, I never felt I was actually being indoctrinated by anything it didn't feel that I it kind of compromised my, my Sikhism, um, and at that time, and I don't know what it's like in schools today, it was entirely sort of possible if you, for religious reasons, if you didn't want to take part in religious service, and religious service actually was more about manners, ethics, possibly versions of liberalism that you're talking about, being nice to people, um, you could just stand by the side and you, and you don't have to take, uh, take part. That seemed for a long time to be sort of standard practice in a lot of sort of British schools. There was no kind of assumption that students, pupils, or their parents would be listened to by, by, the, 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 by the teachers or the administrator, uh, administrators. So, so something clearly has sort of, has sort of changed. We are being asked to participate in the cultures of our schools and to be partners. And then the blowback from that is when you want more of a say, and it's a say that is antithetical to what the school is trying to um, or wanted to uh, wanted to propose. I, I also, you know, grew, grew up in a period, and again, you know, these are useless memories of where there we didn't for all of us kind of you know Asians thought of ourselves as Asians rather than our various Hindu, Muslim, Sikh kind of, sort of categorizations, and where a lot of us actually thought of ourselves as black. And that was a kind of both a sort of political category, an internationalist category, one that was also you know, affiliated with sort of left, uh, left politics. And I guess what we're seeing, and it's, uh, I suppose it sort of happened in the mid 80s, or it's often sort of date, dates back to that, is the, the, the fragmentation of those sort of categories uh, 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 partly according to sort of theology, things get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think, I've been, you know, we're, we're sort of both, we're in, a, uh, in, a, in an era, seemingly, when people use phrases like we're in an era, so sorry about that, but um, <laughs> we're, um, where you know, the, 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 the sincere politics of, of difference are very much in evidence. But I guess myself, and which I felt almost a bit weird being on this panel, I find myself, maybe I'm just too old, a bit indifferent to all of that. And I, uh, the, the languages that I am most interested in these days in, in relation to identity, diversity, politics, are to do with relationship between humans and water, humans and animals, humans and trees, humans uh, um, uh, being alive our relationship to uh, the dead and, and the undead. And to me, you know, the most urgent questions about identity and the future of us as people and, and the, the planet actually are, are huge and are macro. And I feel, I don't know, reined back in, um, shackled to a, a, a bunch of important, significant sort of discourses. But I feel I'm just kind of frolicking in a kind of bubble land of inconsequentiality compared to all, all, all the other stuff. But to be very honest, actually, I don't, we, I don't have an answer, you know, and I think that's part of the problem is that we're wrestling with these, with these kinds of questions. The, the real, you know, is that, of course, we might agree that um, uh, the, the very basic values of a society are to, are to protect different individuals from different um, orientations, expressions, etc. And that when you identify um, a problem with that or an intolerance to that, um, it, it has to be addressed if it is genuinely the foundation of that particular society. But you also in your question bring in or brought up the responsibility you know, of the state. So what I see are many political leaders um, behaving irresponsibly when it comes to that particular. So when Nicolas Sarkozy calls young 
um, you know, ethnic minorities, underprivileged kids, scum, racai. Uh, that's not helpful when he encourages the police to, to throw a tear gas grenade in a mosque. That wasn't helpful either. Um, when Boris Johnson talks about people walking around the letterboxes on their heads, looking like when they wear burqa, that's not helpful. That's not either promoting a, you know, any kind of space in which that kind of, you know, of healthy discussion, you know, can take place. So, Christina, I don't know if you want to, or we can get another question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry, yeah. can I just ask? People, wait, let's see how many hands are up, because then I know you're and going I'll, to... I'll pass it. No, so, no, I wanted to ask a question, and okay, then I'll pass it. Okay, but then we have one here, on. and then one with the other back, and then that's probably going to be it. So did you have a question? Yes, you want to, okay, yes, a question. Pass the mic, and um, we'll get to you uh, next, and then... So and then. I really... First of all, thank you very much. A really stimulating um, discussion, and um, lots of interesting points. I, I sort of wanted to pick up on Sukhdev's... Um, some of the things that you said, which I... Um, I was particularly interested in the sort of the bad migrant, the sort of messier narrative, which I, f I found quite compelling. And I suppose, you know, this sort of, well, I, I can't remember your exact words because I couldn't write quickly enough, but it was you know, this sort of sense of a more porous, sort of imprecise narrative of, of what those things mean. And I was sort of struck by this thought, which I haven't really thought through properly, but that there's always this danger that this sort of great liberal project just sort of recolonizes, you know, and usurps the, the migrant narrative, um, perhaps accidentally, um, as it goes along, because, it, because of a sort of very human desire to classify and organize, and, and that even potentially when those stories are migrant stories coming from migrant communities, there's the danger that there's sort of a sort of colonization of the simulacra, because people don't really remember everything. They remember bits of their past and bits of where they were from and who chooses those stories and is it your mother that remakes that story? And I know my um, Spanish mother, you know, came up with an entire fantasy land of, <laughs> of what Spain was and what it had done for the world and apparently reinvented everything. And, um, and so I'm sort of interested in that, how that this is sort of always this danger that you sort of, you know, the, there's all this sort of simulacra and it's sort of recolonized and almost that you feel the sort of the colonial project hasn't ended. It's sort of reliving itself out in a, in a strange new way, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps because migrant people um, want to be accepted by the host, want to make themselves in a sh or shape themselves in a way they feel is acceptable, not vulgar or crude or messy or awkward, but in a way that is acceptable to the, the white liberal. And so then a sort of, there's a sort of weird repeating of colonialism, but it's happening uh, in a much more complicated and weird sort of way. I, don't, I haven't really thought this through, but anyway, I don't think that's a question either. That's more of a sort of observation. Sorry. Yeah. But if anyone wants to respond to the observation, uh, Christina? Um, I just was interested in your thoughts on this because I think it does come from this idea of not necessarily just a messy story, but a story that doesn't fit into uh, what us as, as immigrants into a country would like to think of ourselves. Because my mother came into the UK speaking five languages, um, three of which were Indian languages and two European languages. And... Um, started to grow me there and refused to teach me any Indian languages, uh, was very keen on me not even really having a Birmingham accent, um, was very keen on me in the kind of way that you were just talking about, almost creating, um, creating, uh, erasing the part of what she felt was problematic when she went out into the world with her Indian accent and not knowing the right way to talk or to uh, behave at a party or these kinds of things that she was finding really painful and her view of how she dealt with it was was to make me into a proper english lady <laughs> which may or may not have worked <laughs> but, um, um, and i and and you were talking about being the first person because i was very much the first brown person in in the place where i grew up and and it was it was 
that was a protection for me in my language and being able to speak well was, was, was a protection for me as well. It was before people started feeling under threat because there were lots of us, too many of us. Um, and so I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Is, is that it's, it's something I don't hear. I don't hear about this kind of shameful, I think, it, it, in, if, if in terms of what the story we want to tell about ourselves as immigrants, that story doesn't fit, really. What, what do you think of that? Thank you. So, also to, to come back, what, what you say um, about you, on, on your comment, I think that um, it, the migrant wants to be accepted. Why your mother forgot her languages? Because, because she didn't thought that it was something important. And then we go back to the responsibility of the state, as you were saying before. So uh, what is, um, uh, if you don't feel that you can share this kind of knowledge that, that, uh, that you have, uh, you refuse it, or uh, either you refuse it, or um, you become, you essentialize it, and you just become as if you were never, you, you were um, more than you, what you have uh, been uh, if, you, if you were in your, your, in your own country. So um, yeah, I think that for me, in my case, it was very important because uh, to go back and, and read songs and, uh, and to, 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 to nurture this kind of connection with, with Somalia, but not in a, in a nostalgic way, just a way using these stories and these songs and this kind of knowledge just to interpret reality and the surrounding reality, which was very different from what those stories were talking about and uh, that the language they use it. So it was somehow a way also to, um, to feel comfortable in the new environment. And, uh, but then again, I think that is also a responsibility of the, the school, of the education, to uh, make space, make room for this kind of a new knowledge and not to erase it and to um, and uh, uh, yeah and not to um, to to make everything uh, homogeneous somehow and and equal and not equal but in small boxes as we were talking saying yesterday. And I can't help but think, but going back to say, your question, the question about you know education as well, is that for so many of the young protagonists are, who are asked these questions um, in France, you know, or elsewhere, will say that the aspiration is, or the promise going back to colonialism is that, you know, if you learn the language, if you do this, you know, you will be French. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is, is quite different from that. And that constant multi-generational push uh, against the suspicion of binationalism, of, of by-belonging, and so on, leads to a creation of, a, of what we know in post-colonial theory as this third space. Um, where you create this, this resistance um, uh, identity, which of course is a self-reinforcing mechanism because it excludes you then from the, uh, from the center. Mm -hmm. You create the periphery as a, as a form of defense. So uh, in France, the, you know, the 2005 really it takes for the, the racial identification, Le Grand movement uh, uh, to come about. It's, it's groups of people coming together with a, a common experience of discrimination in French society who come together in order to articulate a greater desire for belonging, precisely not for exclusion and marginalization, but the exclusion and marginalization is the obvious end result of that constant multi-generational um, pushback against these, um, uh, against young people and so on. Right too. And I think the microphone was moving. Um, yeah, just with reference to that, um there was a word that was used and it was like, what is the answer? And this like looking for answers feels like an inherently Western tradition. Um, whereas what's happening there is a situation and uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more original context, the, the, there, there's l less of like a search for an answer and more individuals who place themselves within situations where, and, and then they are actually the knowledge that works through that situation. And I wonder whether there's not the same sort of mechanism in place in the way that we're thinking about identity. Whereas uh, if I listen to how um, Sukhdev, it, he's almost like describing situations and through living into those situations, any identity emerges. But when there's this desire to apply a general category, say, um, I'm Angolan, but I'm 
which, which is those are perimeters set up by colonialists anyway, that, that's fantastical in itself. That this kind of application of a description gets in the way of like the emergent identities that happen to individuals as they place themselves in situations. I like that. You're reminding me of, I feel so much of how <coughs> pictorially we're represented is just as a set of frozen images, still images, and that's what, how identity is reduced to. I know the filmmaker John Acumfra always talks about his overused images of, uh, of a Caribbean woman working in a manufacturing plant, and it's always in the context of migration. You know, she's either seen as a menace or, or this or that. So she's not thinking of herself as a migrant, probably. She's not thinking of herself as a Jamaican or a British. She's probably thinking, oh, you know, who's going to pick up the kids? I'm a bit late for that, or I wonder if that guy I'm going to meet under the bridge after work is going, is going to sort of show, uh, show up. And these, uh, and uh, yeah, I, even I think one of my problems with identity is because it seems so like kind of lightning. It seems so. It seems so sort of sta static, and we become kind of bur burdened with too much meaning, and something a bit slower, maybe more mundane, more kind of accretive, full of drift, ellipses, tragic comedy, mostly comedy, um, bumbling along. Um, and so much migration is also figured in terms of urban experiences, which obviously I'm in very invested in. But I find actually below all the slogans of antipathy and antagonism, once you get out into a lot of small towns and edge spaces and suburbs, a, 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 sort of, a slightly less apocalyptic um, vision of many nations in Europe is slowly, slowly evolving. Christina, would you like to say a last word? Yeah. Okay. Um, Alan, I think, Alan, do we need to... Um, I think um, if there's no more questions there. I have a sort of, sorry, I, okay. I can absolutely Closing not... Closing remarks, go on. Oh, God. <laughs> Pressure's on. So this is sort of um, not... This is maybe a more personal... Um, kind of question that I want to ask. It's not really very political. Um, it's probably not that important, um, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, so we've been talking a lot about that um, sort of second generation and what it means to keep culture. And I'm sort of really interested in the, in, in the balance between ethnicity and culture uh, in a feeling of belonging and identity. Because um, I'm, I'm sort of third generation. My grandmother is Japanese. Um, which is a sort of slightly straight, it's sort of weird to be a quarter of something, I think, um, because you're that one more step removed. Um, and sort of ethnically in the way that I look, in the way that I'm, I present um, to, to the world, I'm sort of white. Um, but I was brought up culturally with quite a lot of Japanese elements in, in what we ate, in how we spoke. Um, my mother speaks Japanese, but again, didn't teach it to me, um, which I'm really annoyed about. Um, and so I sort of personally feel, and I don't know how many other people in this room might have the same experience because it's not something you can tell by looking at someone, um, feel both like I, I, I sometimes identify with a Japanese culture, but I feel completely unable to claim it as my own um, and sometimes feel like I, I, I'm at risk of appropriating something that is actually still a part of me and my own culture. and I. I think about the choices that my parents made bringing me up and what they chose, the Japanese culture they chose to introduce me and I, and I sort of think, well, that feels really a part of me, really important to me, but, uh, you know, if I have kids, that is, that's then, so, right, at what point does it, does it become not a part of you? Uh, do you know, at what point does that uh, kind of merge and osmose and disappear and become not important? And I just, I don't know the answer and I Thank you wondered so what you much thought. For I am really interested in, in the concept of post-memory that was um, applied for trauma. Uh, this, the, 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 um, the, um, I mean, sons and daughters of the survivors of the Holocaust. But I, can, I, I think that this kind of bodily memory that is transmitted not through the language, but through flashes of imagery and, uh, and some, something that you, you just feel, and it is passed down to us, even though you are not aware of that. So um, I think that language and culture 
are such a diverse, such a complex uh, entities that you cannot reduce them to uh, only to language or to specific memories, but something that you receive even though you are not aware of that. And uh, um, so somehow, yeah, I think that some, something it, it is in, in within you, even though you, you don't think that you have that. And uh, yeah. Okay, can I just add, there's a minor footnote to that, and then maybe this is maybe not exactly what you were talking about, but I guess it's come up in a number of occasions in the last couple of days. I, just as a pet hate of mine, it's a use of, a use of the word white as a kind of, as in a reductive way, as if to suggest the same old, the same old, some standardized thing which is contrasted with apparently more teeming, multitudinous, more interesting non-whiteness. And it's just, uh, amongst the many lies that we tell ourselves or the many fake binaries that we have, this idea of the complexity, richness, mystery, mysteriousness, the assemblageness of, of whiteness, we have to go beyond just this kind of lazy invocation of like whiteness as one without history, one which is not tentacular. Um, and it's, it's just wrong. Mm. And just to say one last thing that immediately came to mind, so the Martinican poet who was along with Senghor and, and Damas from French Guiana who spearheaded the movement of Negritude and the, and the, and the revaloration uh, of the color and so on, came into an interesting debate with the Nobel Prize winning um, playwright, writer Wally Shoinka. And Shoinka's position on it was that, and I'm trying to get this right off the top of my head, was that um, the tiger um, doesn't need to um, talk about his stripes to claim his tigritude, his tigritude, mm -hmm. you see. So you have there the two specters of you. So it might be for you that to claim or what you see as appropriation, you might not need the quote stripes to be able to claim that Japanese which is yours, and uh, it's there. You know, too. Um, thank you so much to Christina and Sukdev.